This is presentation on the era of the silent film. We're going to try to give an accurate depiction of this period and at the same time inject a little entertainment along the way. We're going to show you some examples of films from drama, comedy, war, and the serial. And our fellow classmates are going to give their impersonations of such personalities as Mary Pickford, Charlie Chaplin, and William Gish. The first story we've chosen to review is that of the dramatic film. One basic film of this era was D.W. Griffith's Birth of a Nation. This film was unique, for it was the first time that a motion picture depicted the horrors of war instead of the glory. One of the reasons this movie got its point across was because of the scene we're about to show. The simplicity of the scene, which contained little movement and much feeling. Another scene from Birth of the Nation showed the influence the public of format. Look closely and see if you can notice one event that might have caused the success or failure of a character in the scene we're about to portray. Now I'd like to show a lighter side of the silent film era, the one that everyone thinks of when someone mentions the silent film, the comedy. First of all, we must bear in mind that there were several different types of comedy, some of which are not acceptable today. One of these was black comedy, which portrayed the Negro as a stupid, blundering idiot. Other forms of humor was the slapstick comedy, made famous by such performers as the Keystone Cops. This type of comedy employed such famous routines as the Pratt Fall, inflicting supposed pain, or or the proverbial pie in the face. There were other types of comedy other than this little display, such as the comical routines performed by the illustrious Charles Chaplin, or the little fellow who became famous for his portrayal of the lonely yet humorous vagabond in The Tramp of 1914. This funny walk was based upon a recollection from childhood of the pathetic shuffle of an old drunk who used to hold horses outside of a London tavern. Because of his endearment to the public, for 14 years he was the star of the public and of all motion pictures. He was without a doubt the most famous and highest paid performer of that era. He was a very versatile actor and often played the role of women. Here we portray him in one of his more famous feminine roles from the picture, A Woman. Now to a category everybody enjoys, the rootin' tootin' rip snortin' western. These films sought to portray the real west, wild and woolly. However, there were, due to the puritanical influence which has long governed America's literary and art forms, gallant acts of touching chivalry, even on the part of the villain, as shown here in a scene from the 1920 film Tollgate. In this scene, 
There is shown how an outlaw, whom in his own words, ain't never been no good and doesn't intend to be. Yet he saves Anna Q. Nelson's child from drowning at the risk of his own freedom. Excuse me. <laughs> On the frontier, even outlaws obey the basic code. Here, Bill Hart plays the part of Black Deering. As audiences responded to Hart's realistic lecturing, he extended their range to include every aspect of the old frontier days he knew and loved. His West was both drab and sinister. It pulsated with menace and passion. Men lied and betrayed and fought and killed, but they also loved and sacrificed. Yes, Cindy, but the most sacrifice any man could give would be the sacrifice in war for his country. The film producers clearly foresaw the emotional impact they would receive from these pi pictures and fully took advantage of it by producing many war pictures that were both vivid, exciting, bloody, and cute. Here you might feel the excitement that the audience felt while viewing a simulated World War I dogfight. Although that scene might have been exciting for its day, after the war, people were away from the horrors of the war. In doing this, they placed more emphasis on the romanticism of the film. We're going to show you a prime example of romantics in film with our version of The Sheik. Much of the action of the sheet consisted of a
Colonel, staring at a pleading Agnes air, saw they warily circled each other in preparation for the embrace that was a long time in coming. This famous film was largely a tease, an art at which Valentino was very adept. His employer, Adolf Zucker, wrote that Valentino's acting was largely confined to protruding his large, almost occult eyes until the vast areas of the white were visible, drawing back the lips of his wide, sensuous mouth to bear his gleaming teeth and flaring his nostrils. The films such as The Sheik and the others were all great films in their time, but they always carried a familiar pattern. They always had a definite beginning and a definite end. But too often, the end of a picture, there was something not quite finished or said. To remedy this complaint, producers uh, invented the serial pictures. The serial accomplished three things. One, it brought about in succeeding pictures simulations of situations that might not otherwise be left under determined. Two, it based several different pictures or on one character instead of inventing new ones. And three, it linked the story into several different films, thus facing a viewer to see several pictures instead of one. The best example of this is a 1914 classic, The Perils of Pauline. One of the characteristics of this serial that drew interest from moviegoers around the nation was that it left them hanging from one episode to another, with the immoral words, to be continued next week. That's it. This serial is best remembered for the incredible and many perils Pauline managed to get herself into, and often inflicted by a villain similar to the one in the preceding scene. The scenes from the famed serial look comparatively tame in relation to those that will come after it, but it was the spark that set off the serial craze and did much to confirm the movie-going habit. That's all. Cool. Okay. Another interesting facet of the silent film era were the stars the public made. For instance, there was Maurice Costello, balding and graying, father of Helene and Dolores Costello, who was a movie matinee idol from 1910 to 1917. In contrast to the juvenile leading ladies, male stars of the early period were often on the mature side. But speaking of love and romantics and such, the first screen love team was Francis X. Bushman and Beverly Bain. They kept their marriage secret lest it deflate the illusions of the fans. And then there was John Bunny. People named their babies after this aged comedian. And until his death in 1915, Bunny co-starred with famous, equally popular and famous, Flora Finch, an erring husband and shrewdest wife in a series of one real comedies. But, of course, probably the most interesting star that the public made was Millie Pickford. I wonder who's here, probably so much. Little Mary. For 23 years, Mary Pickford was the undisputed queen of the screen. For 14 of these years, she was the most popular woman in the world. She was literally what she was billed, America's sweetheart. Why? It becomes increasingly difficult to answer the question. How far we have come from an instinctive understanding of her appeal is indicated by Alistair Cook's remark that Miss Pickford was the girl every young man wanted to have for his sister. She was not. She was the girl every man wanted to have, or wished he'd had, for himself. On the screen, her prettiness was often disfigured by a smudged face, tattered dress, and pigtails. 
or she mostly played children, or rather girls in the misty mid-regions between sexless childhood and buxom womanliness, but she seems to have had a strong and specific appeal to many American males in the early century. To hold her lead, she always had to play Little Mary, a girl on the verge of puberty, innocent to the point of idiocy, of any acquaintance with the facts of life, yet always hovering in the wings with a male admirer, frequently elderly, and the implication dangled that someday, beyond the final fade out, perhaps. What was it that set Miss Pickwood apart from all her contemporaries, imitators, and competitors? The answer can only be a guess, but her sweetness and light were tempered by a certain realism. Inevitably, she played the most almost forgotten character, Pollyanna, but played her not so much sacramentally as vigorously. In spite of her creed, the glad girl knew that it was no sense to make everything come out right. Nothing could have been more in tune with the air, which combined limitless optimism with a belief that was always called get up and get, was necessary to make optimism come true. The real Mary Pickford had get up and get before optimism. Born Gladys Smith, she was drilled by her mother in the knowledge that the little family's future depended on the professional exploitation of her good looks. The results of such experiences, so young, are indicated by a conference between the star and Adolf Zucker after two years' work for him had dis demonstrated her supremacy in the box office. You know, Mr. Duke, Mr. Zucker, she said, for years I've dreamed of making $20,000 a year before I was 20, and I'll be 20 very soon now. Zucker learned to recognize his approach. Before long, he was paying her $100,000 a year, then half a million. She knew, and he knew, that she knew that he needed her pictures as bait to lure exhibitors into booking his less desirable features and to establish and consolidate his company's position at the top of the heap. The clincher in her successful bids for more and more money was always that she was worth it. Finally came the moment when she asked for more than even she was worth. To get it, she was banking on her knowledge that Zucker dared not lose her to his competitors. His last-ditch strategy to eliminate her as a factor in the war with him, as described an untimely concerned onlooker, William C. DeMille. With compassionate eye and throbbing voice, Mr. Zucker told Mary that she was tired and that she had been working much too hard for many years and needed a long rest. No line must ever be allowed to mar her beautiful face, nor should that face ever appear on any screen save Paramount's. Just think what Mary and Paramount had meant to each other for these last few years. The thought of her going to another company where perhaps she would not be so well loved, hurt the kindly Mr. Zucker in his deepest and most sensitive feelings. So just for friendship and auld lang syne, he would give her $1,000 every week for five years on condition that she would take a complete rest during that period and not bother her pretty little head about pictures and all. Mary's large, social and expensive eyes opened wide as she regarded her generous benefactor with feeling. She was much touched and deeply moved. Well, the thought occurred to her that, from Paramount's point of view, it was well worth $260,000 to eliminate her for five years as a competitor. She brushed it aside as unworthy. She, too, knew what friendship meant, and her affection for dear, considerate Mr. Zucker was fully as deep as his for her. But after all, she was only a young girl just on the threshold of what might prove to be a successful career. She was a little tired, perhaps, but not quite tired enough to make a five-year vacation, at the end of which she would be undoubtedly five years older. Timidly, in her innocent, childlike way, she explained all this to the man who was so anxious to protect her from the hard life of professional exertion. Tempting as his offer was, she would rather work for $675,000 per annum than rest for $52,000. It desolated her to think of leaving Paramount, where she had been so happy and contented, but, after all, duty was a much nobler goal than mere happiness. So, unless Mr. Zucker could see his way clear to meet these terms, the poor child would say no more. She was a young artist, and they kept forcing her to talk about money. Is it on? Really? Well, that's just about it. That's, I know it's not very long, but we did the best we could. Um, we'd like to thank everybody that had something to do with this film. Vicki, Glenn, John Drucker, Brad Stacy, and Sherry Spaulding. Oh, and uh, Laurel and Hardy here. But most of all, we'd like to thank Mr. Robert Cashbaugh. Uh, he put up with a lot, and uh, he was really cooperative with us. And, well, King Tom, uh, I hope this is good enough for you, because this is it. Good night. That was cute.